<clears throat> we shall allow the people to enter the room. Good morning, all. Uh, thanks a lot for joining on time. Uh, we do have some people still logging in. Uh, we'll allow a minute for all others to join and settle in. Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, good morning and a warm welcome to the PMI Ireland chapter. This webinar is being sponsored by the Project Foundry. My name is Santosh Joshi, Director of Events at Ireland chapter of PMI. I'll be your host today along with my colleagues, Yuraj Venugopal and Paramita Mukherjee. This webinar is being recorded for the purpose of future reference. While uh, attending the webinar, when you have any questions, please feel free to ask the questions in the chat box. Mm. Today's webinar is on the technology and applications in the PMO space, focusing on the pitfalls and the best practices. As a delivery leaders, we are all under the constant pressure and to deal with the changes that are happening in the business, especially the new technologies. When they come in, there is a lot of uh, urgency to implement those technologies without having to look for the readiness about the underlying systems and the processes. This causes a lot of pressure. What is the impact of that on the PMO world? And what the PMOs need to avoid the pitfalls and what PMOs can take as the best practices to deal with this situation. We have eminent speakers today to address exactly these questions. While you attend the webinar, try to see what is that you can take away from this webinar in the form of avoiding the pitfalls and capturing the best practices that you can really use in your current program, project, or even in the future program and the projects. To introduce the speakers, I would like to welcome Yuvraj Venugopal to take over the introduction slide. Yuvraj, over to you. Thanks, Amil Santosh. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. Um, and, and it's absolutely my pressure. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to welcome the speakers today who are Neil Smith, Jan, and Nile. So, you know, <laughs> Neil Smith, uh, you know, who's a chief delivery officer, and he's responsible for leading all delivery active project foundry. His team's focus is on shaping service offerings and capabilities to meet evolving client needs and future growth plans. Yeah. And, you know, we have Jan, who is the head of delivery. Jan has over 15 years of experience in various project and program management roles. And as a head of delivery in the project foundry, Jan also builds capability and excellence for clients, ensuring successful delivery on all projects. We have Nile, who is a PMO lead, and he's responsible for leading the PMO function and developing the PMO team to support the needs of clients. He's also focused on the future PMO landscape, market trends, and insights and descriptive technologies. So I again welcome Neil, Jan, and Nile to you know lead the session today. So over to you, Neil, Jan, and Nile. Thank you, guys. Uh, Niall, do you want to put the slides up? Indeed. Taking a moment, Neil. Technology, <laughs> in, technology in the PMOA now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll kick off then. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I see some names I know and some names I don't know. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is Neil Smith from the Project Foundry. Uh, I'm also a director of technology at PMI Island, uh, working closely with Santosh. Um, at the Project Foundry, our goal is to help business and technology leaders in small, medium and large public and private sector organisations transform through better strategy execution via a range of services uh, with the plan to bridge the gap between strategy, advisory and execution. We provide senior business and technology leaders to achieve this uh, as a viable alternative to large consulting houses. As you may have seen over the last few weeks, we've been publishing a number of insights through short videos and posts via LinkedIn around PMOs and the evolution of the PMO. And there'll be more dropping in the coming weeks. If you haven't seen these, then please do go and check them out or visit our website for more information. Today, uh, Jan and Niall will talk to you about technology and applications in the PMO space. They will look at some of the pitfalls that we've seen from working with many clients across multiple verticals, and they will also talk best practice in overcoming some of these common pitfalls. If you have any questions or queries or would like to challenge what you hear today, then please drop us a question into the chat or follow up with us afterwards. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to Jan and Niall uh, to kick off the presentation. Over to you, Niall. Uh, Jan. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody has a cup of coffee. Uh, if not, don't worry, we will keep you awake, uh, hopefully. So uh, what we want to talk about today, as, as Santosh and, and Neil already mentioned, is the, the technology and how we use technology in a PMO space. Kind of to set the scene that digital strategy is on the forefront on every or most of CIO's minds, and rightly so. Specifically in the PMO world, uh, only 25% of organizations use uh, any kind of PM software. And out of that, only 35% of project managers are actually satisfied with that software. Uh, I would now ask you, if you were in the room, how many of you are still using spreadsheets to, uh, to track your resources? Or how many of you are, when asked for a report, just go to PowerPoint straight away? I probably see a lot of hands up in the air. Uh, and that creates a lot of energy in this space. So on one hand, you have a huge demand, though you have a huge push. You, have, you see all the all, all the signs on your walls of your offices about digital transformation and visions and strategies. But on the other hand, you have this demand for better tools, shiny tools. Uh, and there is plenty to choose from. You know, you you just you just go and and have uh, a number of providers that uh, you can choose from. There are various types of software uh, that uh, you can use. You got PPM, ERP. Uh, some tools are about user experience. Some are about using, you know, they require unique skills. Some are easy to use. Some are a bit more complex to use. Uh, now, do you want uh, going to the next slide? There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, some tools try to deliver a kind of single point of function. For example, uh, you have PPM that specifically focuses on project management. Yet we've seen a lot of organizations that use ERPs to to deliver PPM-like of functions. So the question I want to ask here is: Do you think that best-in-class technology? will lead into a best-in-class PMO. And that's what we want to touch through this presentation. So next 20 minutes, we'll talk about examples where we've met with our customers and we've, through the work, workshops or projects or engagements, Nal and I have been in a number of, uh, number of workshops, discovery sessions, where we, with our customers, we're either building their PMO or we are transitioning from their traditional IT PMOs to enterprise PMOs. Or we were helping customers uh, implementing PPMs, and uh, it's <laughs> I, I have an image in my head anytime I leave a room of a of a nice elegant swan sitting on a lake, kind of looking around. And that represents the digital strategy. That represents the vision. That represents the all the slogans and buzzwords that you see. Uh, but underneath the water, you see the reality. You see the legs just you know, going around and it, it ain't pretty. It's basically our job. It's to just to get the things done 
and constantly move forward. And there sometimes lies the disconnect between the vision, the strategy, and then actually what's happening on the ground. When we go to see customers, uh, we tend to do a word cloud after every workshop just to kind of get our heads around what was discussed in the workshop. And a lot of we see, what are terms we see are projects, obviously, but it's about control, about support, about delivery, about governance. It's about you know, the reality of what's happening on the ground. And a lot of times that reality is slightly disconnected from the vision, from the digitization, from the transformation. Uh, one thing we don't see on the slide, but we also see in the rooms is fear. And that is fear from new technology, fear from a new tool that might come in. Uh, there is a, on the next slide I can see, there's an image of a boat and that represents perfectly what we a lot of times see on the ground when we talk to our customers. So when you talk about people, when you talk processes, when you talk about tools, you can have best in class tools, best in class processes. You can have the best, you can hire the best people in the world, but if they don't, if it's not joined up, if they don't work together, it's going to end up like this. And then one question I want to ask everyone here is, who do you think the project manager in this picture? Who is it the guy who's shouting at himself? Is it the guy who's beating everybody else over the heads? Uh, maybe show me, throw me a few suggestions in the, in the chat. Who do you think the project manager here is? Neil, who do you think the project manager here is? I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> um, you can't see him because he's drowning down the bottom. Yeah, I was thinking the anchor, kind of holding everybody <laughs> down. You always yeah. blame the project manager. Always blame the project manager. Let's see what are what are the what who people think that the project managers are. Nevertheless, we can we can review the chat afterwards. Uh, I so think what, the guy with the horn on the <laughs> on the blown. Talking to himself. Talking to himself. Yeah, that's yeah. what that's what a lot of times feel like. Uh, nevertheless, now it's going to now take you to kind of three key pillars uh, of where the success. What wh what what do we see as the road to success? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> someone just put in. Someone just put in the white. <laughs> like <that one. laughs> Sorry, I like that one. <laughs> now. Okay. Thank you very much, Jan. So as Jan said there, I'm going to bring you through. I'm going to bring you through three three different pieces. Firstly, I'm going to talk about in our experience what the key elements of all transformations are, what particularly the implementation of PPMs um, are rooted on. I'm going to give you some real world examples that we've seen with our customers. Now these are actual customers, highly dynamic, highly successful customers. These are not just ones we've created in isolation. And then finally, I'm going to give you some key takeaways or some insights, kind of to think about this, this is the way our mind is. This is what we've learned. This is what you should be thinking about as well as you go along any type of technology transformation. So as you can see here on screen, we've understood over the multiple um, customers we've worked with, there's many different ways to assess tools. You can look at it from a functional perspective. You can look at the, the list is endless, but in our eyes, it comes down to three specific or three very, very basic areas. These are, as you see on screen, people, process and technology. Using the house of cards analogy that you see on the left hand side of the screen, if one of these is not focused on or it's forgotten, ultimately the ent entire house can crumble. Now, when we talk about people process or when I talk about people process and technology, what I mean about people are people need to be brought on a journey. The implementation of a technology isn't a light switch. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. It's a journey, it's an adventure. People need to be brought on this journey. They need to understand the vision. So as Jan said a moment ago, if you think of the swan analogy, at the very top where the swan looks elegant, you can have the vision, you can have the, the, the ideas of where we're going, the strategy. But underneath it, you've got the people and it can feel chaotic. They need to be brought on this journey. They need to understand. Now, when we're talking about people as well, it's very, very common to think if, for example, you're implementing a project management tool, the only people we need to focus on are project managers. That's absolutely not the case. It's wider than just the project managers. While project managers may input data, there will be others that will consume data. There'll be some that maybe will pull reports. You could have a customer facing portion of it. There's a multitude of stakeholders in the people side that need to be identified and need to, need to effectively be grown and brought on this journey. 
Now, the second one here, processes. When we talk about process, you've probably heard this 100,000 times, but what does good look like? How do we know we've, we've succeeded? What is the benefit? How can we realise it? What we found is beneath a lot of these, it fundamentally comes down to a lot of tools are chosen to fulfil a specific need, to solve a real world business problem. It may be to enhance the efficiencies of project delivery. It may be to introduce better project selection early on, kind of the portfolio management, the strategic piece. But underneath all of these, there are processes. If you understand your processes, you can then understand the problems the areas of improvement or where you need to grow. And then finally, with the technology itself, I'm sure many of you have heard this analogy before, but it absolutely rings true. Square peg, round hole. If you know you need to fill in a round hole, why would you select a square peg? To us, that's a red flag. Fundamentally, you do not understand what your issue is and you're clambering to try and solve it. You need to know the why before you choose the technology. So what I'm going to go, go through now, as I mentioned, I'm going to bring you through two scenarios. Again, these are based on real situations we've been in with highly dynamic, highly successful companies. The first scenario, as you'll see, the challenge was a PPM, so a project portfolio management. Apologies, we're using quite a few acronyms here, and I've always said I wouldn't. But a project portfolio management application was selected by, a, by an organization without any agreed vision or strategy. They expected that this tool would solve all of their problems. Some of the problems they were seeing was effective business case processes, effective project delivery in the context of multiple different methodologies. They couldn't, couldn't identify what the methodologies were. They couldn't track the, the separate methodologies. There was no consistency when it came to reporting. Therefore, there was no one overall message or one clear way to identify how projects were doing. And ultimately, they were unable to realize the benefits of the projects. So what this really actually looked like on the ground, as Jan said, at a high level, it can look great. But on the ground, when we spent time with the people, we understood there was fear. I suppose it's human nature that with change comes fear or apprehension. That must be acknowledged and it must be reduced. This is evident for anyone in the audience that has ever been either involved in implementing or on the other side of the introduction of timesheets. Normally, when people hear timesheets, they 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 get on the defensive. They think, why do people want to track my time? Why, why does leadership not trust me? This is going to this is going to make my life harder. How can I calculate every single minute I spend of every day? It's understandable. This these are the type of fears that we saw. As well as that, there were two types of pressure that they were seeing. Firstly, there was a new tool being introduced. They didn't know what the tool really was. They didn't share the vision. They felt they were being pressurized to use a tool that they had no say in, or they didn't feel their, their needs were being addressed. The second type of pressure, again, you'll always hear this, there will be more work, more admin for them on a day-to-day -day basis trying to use this tool. Fundamentally, they were not on the journey, the transformational journey. So from a process perspective, what became very, very clear here was while they did have a level of process mapping, they were very immature and it wasn't the process maps, by the way, not the people were very immature and they were inconsistent. Some maps were developed in isolation of others. Some were as simple as here's the start, here's the end of a process. Some process mapped, maps include triggers, actions, owners, inputs, outputs. There was no consistency. And as these were developed in isolation, there was no end to end view, no clear picture of how the end-to-end -end project life cycle was working. And then finally, with the technology, as I mentioned at the start, they made a decision on a technology without fully understanding the issues they had at hand. Why they selected the technology, your guess is as good as mine. It could have been a result of very effective marketing. It could have been word of mouth. They could have read a review. Not sure why, but they had made the decision. So what did this mean when Project Boundary, when we were called in to help? We identified that these were their main issues. And again, with the three key areas, we looked at the people, we looked at the processes, we looked at the technology. What this meant was, from a people perspective, the key here, you've probably all heard change management, communication strategies. 
we introduced control communication, reassurance and support two very, very important, important items. What this really meant on the ground is we TPF were able to help our customer create an overarching change management strategy and communication plan. This culminated in um, consistent messaging from senior leadership, positive messaging about this new tool. The creation of TikTok type videos, short, maybe 20, 30 second clips showing what the tool looks like, the benefits of the tool, trying to generate a little bit of excitement. We asked them to facilitate open door sessions, so both during and preceding the implementation to give people an open and honest forum to ask questions, lay any grievances, whatever may be, showing that the company cared and that the support was there. Ultimately, we wanted to make sure the people knew there was a journey, what the benefits were to them when this was going to happen. So really, the people side was key to this, as is the case with, with a lot of transformation in general. From the process side, as I mentioned, they were immature. There was no real standard way of, of approaching process maps. What we did was, with their help, we looked at all of the process maps. We identified how they linked together, and we were very quickly and easily able to identify where some processes were actually not valid. They were historic. They probably weren't used anymore. We were able to identify processes that could be enhanced or refined. We were able to identify new processes that were needed. Most importantly, we were able to understand who owned the processes and what the inputs and outputs of those processes were. The final piece around the technology. So what we what we tend to find, and we do say it jokingly, but one of the first things we do with our customers is we bring all of the stakeholders together into a room for a therapy session. This can be the first time that a lot of these people are actually given the opportunity to voice their opinions, voice their, their needs, their wants, their desires, and also their apprehensions for tools. This is a really, really insightful uh, scenario to see and be involved in. As humans, we need the ability to, to, to talk. We need to be able to air our grievances in a safe environment. So what we do, we bring everyone together, as I mentioned, we go through the therapy sessions and what this then culminates in, we build the requirements. It's really, really important to make sure that you have your requirements not only created, but agreed by all stakeholders involved. This serves many purposes. Firstly, you can identify what success looks like, but most importantly, you have a shared vision that's agreed by all. You have excuse me, a plan of action. People's needs are being are being met. The final piece to it is when it comes to the rollout of applications, you may need multiple phases. You can get everyone's agreement on what good looks like initially or what the MVP is. And that's how we approach this customer. Again, we focused on the people. We identified the processes, what was working, what wasn't. And finally, we brought everyone together, documented the requirements. And in this case, the requirements weren't used to select the tool, but they were used to help configure the tool to the needs that the customer wanted. Now, the next scenario, this is actually kind of the contrary to the previous one. We had a situation where an organization were using multiple applications across multiple teams, fundamentally fulfilling the same need. By this, there were multiple different delivery applications. There were multiple different templates for raids, for example. There were multiple reports. There was multiple different governance structures. Everyone was working in their own little silos. They did have a PMO in situ. It was immature. It wasn't empowered and it was not able to set standards. So what this meant from the people, everyone was working in silo. It was very much the idea of this is how we work here. We know what we know. We do what we do. There were some standards in place, there were some templates, but there was no consistency and there was no ownership. So everyone was really working in isolation of one another, meaning at an organizational level, it was a mess. From a process perspective, again, as people were working in isolation, the processes were fractured. There was no joined up thinking, linking between the business case. Again, I'll go back to the business case through to benefits realization. And finally, as a result of all of this, I did mention a moment ago, 
with them using multiple different types of technologies, standards, and so forth, there was no single source of truth for the status of their projects. Every team would report differently. There was no clear understanding of what red, amber, green meant, what risks are, what issues are, and so forth. There was no joined up thinking, meaning leadership and management really had no control or understanding of what was happening with these projects. People were left to their own devices. So what did that mean when TPF came in? Again, we looked at it from three scenarios, people, process, technology. The keen eyed among you will see actually, this is the very same as the previous, the previous scenario, and that is intentional. It really does come down to get the basics right. Remember the house of cards, get the basics right, and you'll be able to build from it. So for the people, again, controlled communication, reassurance and support. We instigated a change management strategy. We made sure people were brought on this journey. We made sure that people understood that while they may be working within their own teams, there are other teams that they're also working with and they will benefit from an overarching framework or method to deliver. Again, it was around making sure everyone's brought on the journey, they understand the benefits, when a PMO is, is brought, so an organizational level PMO, how they will benefit from that, how there'll be training, development, all of these kind of buzzwords to help them on this journey. From the processes, very similar to before, we met with the teams, we understood what processes they had, we tried to identify how they would link together. And one thing that became very apparent very quickly was maybe naively, we believed that as they were working in silo, they were going to be totally different. Fundamentally, they were all working off the same basic approach to project management. While there were some nuances, it meant that when we were creating the end to end, it didn't look unfamiliar to people. So we were able to, as a team, end to end process, identify how to trim the fat, what processes weren't valid, what can be improved and so forth. And again, from a technology perspective, we got everyone in a room, we ran the therapy sessions, we built the requirements, we let people share, share their needs, and ultimately we were able to define what success looked like when a PMO was implemented to this space. Okay, so again, these are very similar scenario, or very similar solutions to two kind of contrasting scenarios. And again, just trying to get across that sometimes doing the basics right is the foundation you need to succeed. So with those two scenarios, I'm going to bring you through some takeaways now, some learnings that we have and, and some insights for you to think about as you are on this journey or if you're beginning this type of journey. So from the people perspective, I know I'm going to reiterate it again. People are the linchpin that holds the technology together. If the people do not buy in and use the technology, the technology will ultimately fail. Now, when it comes to people, there are a lot of considerations that need to be made and um, I'll give you some examples. So TQ or technical quotient, this is around the knowledge and skill sets that your resources have. So why this is important, if your people are used to using Microsoft type technology and you want to introduce Oracle or SAP, there will be a significant amount of time and investment needed in training and development as they may not have the skills to use this type of technology. So technical quotient is really, really important. As we work in a global nature and we've got multiple cultures, languages, so forth, when it comes to technology, there needs to be a common and simplified language. For someone who may not have English as their first language, if they are using a tool that's been designed with a multitude of acronyms, complex titles, they're not going to understand and it's really important to remember that it's very easy to lose people's trust. To get it back is very, very difficult. So be very, very mindful that you could have other people working in these applications that do not have English as their first language. And the final piece is around neurodiversity. So neurodiversity is how we interact with the world, how we interpret, how we understand, how we learn. For those of you that have been doing any research recently on um, applications or technologies, you'll find that a lot of the features or one of the key features that they will call out is, apologies, I don't know the correct term, but it's in and around conforming to a neurodiversity standard. 
when we talk about neurodiversity, one of the most common areas to think about is around color blindness. So one in 20 males and one in 200 females are colorblind. When we say colorblind, it's not being unable to see specific colors. It's predominantly around shades. So seeing multiple shades of a single color with no clear differentiation between texts. That's really, really important when it comes to technology. And it's almost a giveaway of an old fashioned technology that's not neurodiverse versus a new technology. OK, so in a nutshell, people, what do we need from people? We need to bring them on the journey. They need to know the benefits. They need to know how this impacts them day to day. They need to realize that they are actually going to benefit from this tool. It's not just the business. So keep the people happy and the tool will work. Hopefully, touch wood. Now, in and around processes, as with any journey or even any project, how do you know what success looks like? How do you know you've achieved? What, what is good? What are the benefits? In order to, to do this, you need to understand the problems. The vast majority of problems that we've seen come from a lack of understanding of existing processes. Best practice would be have all of your processes created, have them mature, and then implement a tool that, that supports it. In reality, that's not always the case. Sometimes tools can actually highlight process improvements, but the vast majority of time, if you do not know the square peg round hole, if you do not know your issues, you do not know your processes, you are setting yourself up for failure. So when it comes to processes, you need to be able to ask yourself, do we know what processes we have today? What the as is, what, what the to be or what we'll need tomorrow? Do we know what processes add value? What processes are, are time consuming? What process can be improved? How do we know where we can really make a difference, make a change? Another piece which we haven't really touched on is automation. So this is this is a, a big trend over the last two years, particularly within the PMO space. Automation is predominantly around processes. You can obviously get a lot more technical. You can get into machine learning and going through multiple different types of, of algorithms. But to automate processes, to truly automate them, the processes need to be refined and succinct. Okay, the final piece, it's, it's not relevant to everyone, but when it comes to specific processes, sometimes you need to be mindful of local laws, regulations and standards. If, for example, you're in more of a governmental type body, there will be different standards that you may have to conform to than other companies. So something just to be mindful of. And the final piece here is around technology. What I'd like to do is I'd like to share some misconceptions of technology, and I will absolutely hold my hand up and say that I've I've believed these myself, and only through the multiple scars and, and knockdowns I've had do I realize I we need to consider these. The first one is that technology will not always seamlessly integrate with your existing infrastructure. APIs are not going to fix everything. They're not going to give you everything you want. Oftentimes you will find that while some applications will say they integrate, for example, with a development type tool like Jira or DevOps, the communication may only be one way. So that would mean any new technology you're implementing that possibly you want as a single source of truth, it may not actually be able to contain that information. There may not be real time updates. So introducing a technology and APIs does not mean it's going to work in your existing infrastructure. Another misconception is if we introduce a tool, the tool can give us the very same management dashboards, reports that we have today. No change in look and feel, everything will remain the same. While this is possible, there is more than likely a significant investment needed in configuration and development to do so. When in actuality, the technology is a perfect example for enabling change, improving the reports you're doing, and leveraging the features that are there today. So being able to go in open minded, see how the tool can benefit you is really, really important. Don't try to recreate what's done today as a saying I've heard many times standing still is falling behind. You need to make sure you're looking to the future. And the final one I'll mention around a misconception is that if you introduce technology, any technology, your delivery efficiencies will, inc will increase and people will be happier, you'll realize benefits. That's not always the case. Back to Jan's point, you need to choose the right tool 
based on the issues you're seeing to give you the benefits you want. Not every technology is the same. Regardless if they say they are, you need to spend the time to understand. So some questions you should always ask yourself when it comes to technology, and this is a really, really important one. I've kind of touched on it. You need to understand the IT environment that you currently have within the four walls of your company. Your IT teams will have their own internal development strategies. They'll have application strategies. It makes more sense to choose a technology that aligns to their strategies than something very, very different. A number of reasons for that. Something as simple as if you need configuration or enhancements or troubleshooting, you may not have the skills on site to do that. You may be reliant on third parties. That will take time and cost. It's not really worth it. The first place, do you need a new technology? Is the, the tool you're using today, is that fit for purpose? Are you simply looking to change because you want the shiny and new technology? Absolutely, you can choose to do that, but you need to weigh up the investment versus the benefit. Final piece on it is who's going to own the technology? It's one thing introducing a technology and being a user of it, but someone needs to ultimately own this. They need to maintain it. They need to ensure the integrity of the data. If there's no owner, people can make changes left, right and centre. You can lose total control of the tool and therefore your investment has been wasted. So always make sure there are owners, there are admins, there are skills, there's ongoing development and ultimately it's going to give you what you want. I think that's pretty much it for me from from these pieces. So I'm going to hand over to Yana for the final conclusions. But as mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, please post them into the, the chat window or feel free to email us directly. Uh, Nayan, there are a couple of questions on the chat box. Would you like to take it now or you would like to take it later? Uh, I actually wanted to do a conclusion, but I'm, I'm looking at these questions right now, Santosh, and actually uh, the first one really much uh, and it underpins what, what Niall was saying there. So just for everyone, I'm looking at a question here from Edmund Galvin. So is any question or any suggestions on how you would implement a new PPM technology in an organization where the value of a PMO may not may not probably be well understood? Uh, if you go back to the analogy or of the picture of the boat where everybody's kind of rowing different directions and we were kind of guessing who the PM is, uh, I think it was the wife, was who was the PM, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think in this scenario, uh, Edmund, it's about a do we why did you implement or why did you why are you implementing a PPM technology? That's the first question I would ask. Second question I would ask is if it's not if the value of PM is not well understood, why is it? Do you have a brilliant team that just cannot brilliant PMO team that just cannot sell its value to management or does your PMO team need to go to your management or whoever doesn't recognize its value and sell its value? So say, you know, these are the standards that as a PMO team we are trying to enforce or we are trying to we are trying to uh, implement. These are the processes. This, this is the technology. Going back to the points that now made, people, technology, processes. That if your PMO is is addressing these three areas uh, and it's is addressing them that it brings value to the organization it will then link up with implementing new ppm technology and through that you will realize value of the pmo team uh, so if you go back to uh if you go to the next slide there Niall, if you go to the initial side of the boat uh where people shouting at each other and rowing different directions if you have these three pillars addressed where I'm assuming the project manager is the guy with the who is shouting at everybody. Uh, they're all rowing the right direction because they have uh, there is a process in place. They have the best tools, and suddenly you become a, a, a misfunctioning team or dysfunctional team become becomes a, a team that all goes the right way, the right direction, and the right speed. And just just to add to that, yeah, and I'm kind of to pick up on on one piece of that as well is unfortunately justifying or quantifying the value of a PMO can be very, very difficult. Um, a lot of times the focus is on, well, we have X number of resources. They seem to be fulfilling a need, but we're actually seeing the benefits with delivering projects. This is really where a mature 
project management office or even an enterprise level office, once you have the standards, the best practices, the templates in place and senior leadership, for example, are able to quickly and easily see benefits or see maybe increased efficiencies with project delivery, this is when the PMO truly shows its value. So the PMO is not only to support the, de the delivery people, the PMs, but also the communication upwards. They almost can sit as the middleware between, using the SWAN analogy again, the, the top level strategies, goals, objectives of the company, the on the ground work. So the PMO can actually fit two purposes. And when a PMO is mature and efficient, it creates clear lines of communication and most importantly, visibility and transparency between these. So it's not really a, a, an easy answer, but just acknowledging that sometimes it can be difficult to, to validate the value of a PMO, unfortunately. Uh, there's a similar question from Owen. Was there a defined PMO sponsor and budget for these PMO implementations? I think I, again, links to what Nile just said there. Uh, yes, there was a defined sponsor. And what Nile said, we work with or these organizations we worked with specifically for those, those two examples. They're very highly successful and growing organizations. And for them to scale in the pace they have been scaling for now uh, and scale further and grow further, they recognize that they need a single source of truth. They need to understand how their budgets, how their projects are run. They need to understand how to realize benefits or, or of each project. And that's why they bring they brought us. I don't want to turn this into a in, in, into a, a TPF sales pitch, but uh, that's why they brought us. And uh, because they realized they need to build a PM or enterprise PMO team that is will deliver on all these challenges that they had when it comes to scaling and single source of source of truth and understanding where the business is. Ultimately, it's all about control, understanding where I am right now. And one thing that comes to mind, Jan, just based on what you're saying there is we've seen whenever we speak to, to some of the customers, they themselves may not have a clear understanding of what a PMO is. Some people, for whatever reason, just have a view that PMO are effectively like auditors. They're, they're just there to make sure that everything's done correctly. They're going to crack the whip. It's a very old fashioned way of looking at, at a project management office. PMOs have evolved and a lot of times you need to inform, update and guide people as to truly what a PMO means. You need that shared understanding. A uh, question from Robert for a small PMO, which is relatively immature, currently without tools. What are the benefits, if any, that you would expect to see or that are realistic targets based on TPF experience? I think it goes back to basics. So no matter what's the scale or size of your PMO, if it's uh, one person or uh, uh, enterprise PMO, it's understanding of getting back to basics. That's my, when I was delivering projects as a PM, as a project manager or program manager, it's all about basics and control. So if you have a small PMO team, that's, as you said, is relatively immature. It's what value can I bring to my delivery team or to my management team? Uh, is it, and it doesn't have to be related to, to PPM tools or any kind of tools. Do I have the common vision, for example, when it comes to report? Is there a standardized report structure that we have in place? Is there a standard way of, of, uh, of uh, categorizing projects? Is there a standard way of how we categorize risks? These things are simple. They, are, they could be perceived as boring. They're not very sexy. Brand new PPM with shining colors and graphs. People love it. Uh, it's brilliant, you know, I, I, I can do this. I, it's uh, risks, red lock or red locks, amber, green, red. That's not very sexy, but that's actually a very effective and efficient way of how to bring value and control over your projects. Yeah, and so can I just jump in? Jan, can yep. I jump in there? So the, the, back to Robert's question, for the, the size of the PMO, size of the PMO is irrelevant. It's the immaturity or the maturity that is the important part. Um, and when we talk about people, process, and technology, it's not necessarily this big, massive EPMO tool that we're talking about technology. Technology could be a good Excel spreadsheet, a really good pro, a really good using the Microsoft Office 365 or the Office 365 suite. That's what we thought, but it's getting the right technology for you that suits the size and the maturity of your PMO. 
uh, the size, as I say, is, is kind of irrelevant. It is finding the right, working with the right people, the right processes and the right technology. And Neil, just to reiterate um, a point that you touched on there, which is really, really important for, for people to remember is, like many things, one size does not fit all here with a PMO. What maturity and success looks like for a PMO in company A would could and most likely will be very different in company B. In order to mature, <laughs> you need to understand what processes are in place, how you can improve them, which in turn will allow you to show that value and begin to mature your, com your company, your PMO, excuse me, as it grows and grows at the company. So Great. one size does not fit all. Brilliant. Uh, the next question from Andrew is, how do you bridge the gap between CRM and PPM tools to ensure the best visibility of incoming pipeline and the resource needs for long-term planning, or do you at all? Uh, of course you do. <laughs> uh, I think it depends. I think we could probably have a long discussion on this. Very short answer for me, and I'll let the guys answer as well, is, hey, what is my overall goal of the organization? Is, is Are the CRM and PPM tools already in place, or is it something, a new technology that you're trying to bring in? Uh, ultimately, it's about the, the vision of the organization, what I'm trying to get out of this, what I'm trying to put out, what I'm, what is, what I'm trying to, what the end state looks like, and how, what are, what are the, what's the functionality of the CRM and PPM that are currently in place, and can I bridge them together? Uh, it, it, it really does depend. Uh, Niall, what, what do you think? Um, I suppose yeah, this is, we could really be going down a rabbit hole with this conversation, but in my eyes, the, the the first piece of that question is, do you actually need the CRM and the PPM application to to interact? Yes, it would be possible, but you need to be able to understand what is the actual benefit in doing it. Also, when you begin to combine applications, you run into a lot of technical decisions that need to be made about the type of data that's shared, data security, are you storing certain types of information? It is a rabbit hole, so you really need to be very, very careful and really analyze, do you need your entire architecture infrastructure, excuse me, to speak to this PPM tool? Or is it better placed in isolation in its own? That's I, think that, I, I think that's an important point, yeah. And Andreas is giving you a thumbs up there. I think that is a really important point. Um, look at your whole technology stack. And you get you get some you, you, people get excited and go that's got to talk to that and you've got to get the API working here towards <laughs> talking to that API and you don't um, output into a spreadsheet is not a bad thing if you if that's what you if that's what suits and works for the organisation uh, it obviously if you can get them talking and you get the right information transferred that's ideal but it, it can often uh, as as Niall says go down that rabbit hole and it spend months developing APIs and there's no discernible benefit from it. So find out what's right for your your technology stack um, and, and the, the information that needs to flow from tool to tool or from tool to a spreadsheet to a Power BI to a dashboard, etc. There you go. Are there any other questions? Sorry, I can't see the... the no, that, that's it. Okay. Uh, there's one just come in there now. Focusing on the resource management piece of the whole thing, I'm curious to know what will be your top 10. Top 10? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> top 10 best practices. Okay, we might give you a couple, we might give you a couple <laughs> Jose. We're not going to give you 10, but go on. <laughs> um, sorry, what was that question again? I got focusing distracted once you said 10. Focusing, focusing on the resource management piece of the whole thing, I'm curious to know what, what would be your top 10 best practices from a resource management perspective. Uh, I'll start. Maybe I'll take the first one. Uh, When we talk, talk about resource management, we also talk about capacity, we talk about time tracking, we talk about uh, planning. They're all interlinked. To me, it starts with, and, and now I'll mention it about time tracking. Uh, it starts about understanding of no, or knowing where my resources are at the, currently, where you're there, where, how many resources do I have, what's the skills of the resources, what type of resources do I have, and what is the pipeline of work coming in. So the first best practice to, for me is do I have a con or having a control over where the resources are? And that goes back to what we were describing there about tools. So being a spreadsheet, being a PPM tool or any kind of tool, do I have the right view, the single source of truth of where my resources are 
what they're currently doing and what are they what are the, what is the plan for the resource to be doing in the next number short term or long term to add to that jan as well do, do you have the authority to make decisions on centralizing resource or capacity management as you will be crossing multiple different teams and, and we've actually seen this with with one of our customers what capacity means to an individual on the business side may not actually be equatable for example, on the IT side, if they're running with scrum teams, they're looking at a unit versus an individual. So it's very, very important firstly to, to understand the wider implications of capacity management, the roles and so forth, but also are you the right person to make this decision? Don't rush in to try to, to, to create a capacity management process without fully understanding your environment, the teams, the people and what they need from this. Maybe the third one would be, and that's specifically to PPM tools, have your tool set up correctly for when it, when it comes to the type of resources and hierarchy for the projects. Have when it comes to what project, what are the projects, what are the programs, what are the portfolios? And uh, I think it's key. We've seen a lot of organizations that have a good process when it comes to resource management. They have a good PPM tool but the PPM tool is not set up in a way that and it's not, it is not standardized. That means when a new project comes in, it's not set up as a standard project. There are various types of projects and hence it's very hard to plan and it's very hard to standardize your pipeline uh, and your forecast because the projects are not standard and it's not easy to figure out what type of resources I need going forward. The, the final one for myself, Jan, and I think this is my very last brain cell at this point, given the, the time of the morning and lack of coffee, is if you are using a centralized tool for resource management, make sure that the processes for the input of information are always followed. Try not to bypass, well, not try not to, do not bypass processes. If there is not a structured approach to um, requesting resources, assigning resources, it will not be effective and also make sure that you have a defined process and owner when it comes to approvals or declines of resource requests. So make sure you have that process. It's regulated, it's controlled, it's owned, it's followed. So Jose, you've got four out of 10 for the remaining six. You have to go to the projectfoundry.com or contact me. <laughs> uh, I love it, Jan, I love it. <laughs> Brilliant. Are you going to do conclusion, Jan, or have we done them? I think that's. I think that is the conclusion done. I think we've we've run through a number of questions. So, well, thank you very much for your time this morning. It was a pleasure, uh, and I'll hand over to Santosh. Sure. Thanks a lot, Jan. Uh, thank Neil and Ni Niall. It was a really uh, informative session. Uh, over to you, Paramita, to uh, explain about the PDUs the people can get for attending this session. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. I would also like to thank Neil, Yan, and Nile for a very insightful session and the concept of PPT in the PMO space and that all not one size fits all and uh, we need to know our actual requirements. Thanks. So uh, the Ireland chapter of PMI supports the professional development of our members and you will earn one PDU for attending this webinar. So it consists of 0.5 business PDUs and 0.5 power skill PDUs. The PDU claim code as shown on the on the slide uh, in front of you is C144802NAR. So if you're a member of the Ireland chapter of the PMI, we will auto register the PDU for you when you attend this live seminar webinar. Or you can also self claim the PDU using the above code. So thank you so much for attending. Over to you, Santosh. Sure. Thanks a lot, Paramita. Thanks all uh, presenters and also the organizers and the participants for joining the session. We can conclude this uh, webinar now. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank you. All. Thank, Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.